The title of the message is Story Time. And I don't know about you, but um, when I was a kid, I loved story time. Like, I loved when my mom and dad would just share a story. Maybe it was a story that actually happened in, in their life, and, and they, would just, they would just share it with us. Or, or maybe it was just a, a story, an actual story book or something along those lines. But when you think about it, when we were kids, I mean, we loved stories. And, and it was really even more amazing. It was really even more great when you had either, if it was your, your mom or dad, or you had a, a grandparent or aunt or uncle, that was telling the story and brought the story to life. Have you ever just had somebody tell a good story and just really brought the story to life? Like brought it to life in such a way where you, you felt like you were in the world. Like they described the world so perfectly and some books are written so well that, um, uh, that put a perfect description to, to a world that bring it to life that you just feel like, Man, I feel like I'm right in the center of this world. I feel like I'm right in the center of what's happening. I feel like I, I, I see the characters around me that, that we're reading about, that we're talking about. And some people just have a great way of not only writing books, but some people also have a great way of even, um, even reading a story and bringing that story to life. And the same thing, like if you think about it, even as adults, I mean, we love a good story, don't we? I mean, that's why we watch movies all the time. That's why we go home and watch, watch a good movie or, or jump over to Hollywood 20 or, or Silver Spot and, or here at Pavilion and, and catch, a, catch a movie, something that we really want to see. Guys, we love, obviously, we just love action-packed movies. We're not all about the chick flicks, but, you know, every so often I'll, I'll, sit, I'll suffer through it with my wife and, and watch a chick flick. But we, as guys, we love the action-packed movies. And ladies, for you, like I said, you, you love a good romance movie. And, and, and you love, we all love a good story. We love a good movie. I wonder, though, I wonder if we know, like, what exactly it takes to put a movie together. Like, what exactly it takes to put something, not only in book form, but then especially to put something on the big screen, to put something where you and I, we watch it and we see it. And I wonder if we've ever even considered, like, how long did it take to create something like that? How long did it take to put something together like that? How long did, did, did how many hours went into that? I wonder if we've ever thought about that because we sit there and we watch something that entertains us, but it takes some time to put something like that together. The process begins when screenwriters turn over their script to storyboard artist Eric Favela. The script may say something, a, a very basic action, Scrat comes out from behind a tree and sniffs, and that may look something like, you know, I have the tree here, I arrange it how I think it should look in the movie. For a sequence in the film that may last only a few minutes, Eric draws some 500 panels. Jake Parker is one of the designers creating a look for the film. It's very angular. Uh, there's lots of sharp shapes, uh, uh, almost as if it's carved out of ice. His paintings, some done on the computer screen and some on paper, become the virtual sets for the film. While the designers are working on the sets, Mike DeFeo is sculpting Scrat in polymer clay. When it's drawn out or you're just sort of speculating on what those poses might work, uh, you know, on paper, when you get them in 3D, you find a lot more that you can finesse it. Blue Sky Studios specializes in photorealistic, high-resolution, computer-generated character animation and rendering. In computer-generated animation, there is no camera, no set, and no actual lighting. All of that is virtual and complicated. Brian Keene says the process of making an Ice Age film takes about three and a half years versus a live action film which might be shot in six months. For a 90 minute movie at 24 frames a second that's approximately 130,000 frames of individual art that have to be created and digitized and, and brought to life and, and rendered with our proprietary software. If you were to fire a, a ray of light from a light source it calculates how many different points of intersection that ray of light will hit. It might be the way it would bounce within a character's hair to the way it would reflect and, and bounce and move through water. Some of it would deflect into the water, some of it would bounce off the water. It's the visual representation of a world that exists only in the computer. So notice that. I mean, over 130,000, I think he was saying, 
individual pieces of art that have to be created in order to make this animated film. And you heard him also say that it could take close to around three years just to make an animated film. Around three years as opposed to maybe a year or so with a, a live action film. So it could take a lot of time. You saw the guy drawing the individual art. The one guy was drawing the, the backgrounds and the other guy was actually drawing the characters. And then you had the sculptor because uh, obviously they're creating it on the computer. But like he was saying, you're, you're able to really see, you're able to really get a, a view and a, and a picture of what the character looks like when you, when you have it in 3D form as far as being sculpted. And, and so you have all these different pieces that go into play. There are hours upon hours, days, there is a long process that goes into putting together an animated film like Blue Sky uh, does or, or like Pixar does and putting these things together. It takes hours and it takes hours and days and days and again, sometimes years to have every one of these things drawn out that they're going to use in the movie, to have every one of these things uh, put together and to make an actual animated film that could be somewhere around an hour and a half to two hours long that you and I, we watch it and we're just like, wow, this is great. This is a great film. I love the movie and all of that, but not realizing how much goes into that. Now, for some of you, I mean, some of you are, are, are probably already bored because that, that just frustrates you to death. You have no patience for it like me. I have no patience to sit down and draw something and, and take forever to, to see the final product. Now, here's the thing. Josh, why in the world are you talking about an animated film? Like, why are we getting educated on how an animated film is built? I want to use that to show you something else that I, that I believe will, will bring into light maybe something you've never seen before. And it comes from Psalm chapter 139. Psalm 139, verses 14 to 15. This is actually King David. He's writing, this, uh, he's writing this psalm under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And he speaks this out, speaking about God. Notice what he says. He says, I will give thanks to you because I have been so amazingly and miraculously made. Your works are miraculous and my soul is fully aware of this. So notice that David, first off, he starts off, he says, I'm going to give thanks. I'm going to give thanks, I'm going to give praise, I'm going to give honor to whom the praise and honor and glory and thanks is due, and that's to you, God, because what I've realized, and, and you got to understand something, David is living at a time where they don't have the technology that you and I have. They, they can't see into the body and, and see all of those things that nowadays that we can see, that scientists can see and that doctors can see, all of this, all of this stuff that make up the body. And David was totally perplexed. He was already totally like just dumbfounded by the fact that, wow, there is something amazing about this body that, ha that I have. There is something that is amazing about people as I see people walking around, as I, as I see men and as I see women walking around. There's something amazing about the body that every single one of us walk in. And so first off, David starts off and he says, I give thanks because I realize that I am fearfully, that I am wonderfully, that I am amazing, amazingly and miraculously made. And again, he says, my soul is fully aware of this. Verse 15 my bones were not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, when I was being skillfully woven in, in an underground workshop. In other words, he's talking about being formed. He's saying, man, there was, there was something happening. There was something going on. And, and that, wasn't, that wasn't a surprise to you, God. It wasn't hidden from you. You knew exactly what was going on. You knew ex exactly what was happening because you were the one that was doing the forming. You were the one that was doing the creating. You were the one that was in planning something, making something happen in my mother's womb. Now here's the thing that I want to, that I want to throw out there. And that is you and I, we are not, hear me on this, we are not just thrown together. And so just like an animated film, that it could take hours upon hours just creating a character. It could take days and days and hours and a whole bunch of effort and a whole bunch of energy and, and a whole bunch of stuff that have to fall into place in order to create a character. And that we could see and we can say, wow, you know, we enjoy the film, but we're not exactly sure what all goes into it. But just getting just a glimpse from what Blue Sky talked about and, and just the hours that it takes. How do we think that in all the perplexity, in all the intricacy, in everything that we have found, and, and especially with technology, how can we think that when we look at, when we look at all of this that, that we see that makes up this body, how could we say 
that this is just thrown together? How can we say that your body is just thrown together? That my body is just thrown together? There is an intricacy there. And not only an intricacy, there are many intricacies in, 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 our, in our physical body. And it's perplexing at times. Like even, even scientists and, and doctors today, they're still perplexed. They still don't know everything there is to know about the human body. There are still a lot of things that perplexes doctors and, and, and scientists today about the human body because there's so many intricacies. And here's the other thing. I cannot see, there is no way I can fathom us just coming, being birthed out of some primordial soup, as some people might believe. Or that aliens just kind of implanted the earth or whatever other garbage that's, that's out there that, that, that people believe. When you look at the human body and you see all the perplexity and you see all of the intricacies, it has to, it has to cause you to think about a creator. It has to. I mean, how could you just look at that body and, and look at the, the intricacies and look at all the stuff that has to go into motion, all the stuff that has to work properly in order for this body to move, in order for it to accomplish, in order for it to do what its, what its intended purpose is, it has to point you to a creator. I mean, can we look at the body and say, well, yeah, this is just, just over time. Pieces just kind of came together and man evolved and, and all of this just kind of happened oh, over time, over time. That all, that all took place. Really? I mean, do we really believe that? When you look at the body, there's a lot of intricacies. In fact, let me share some of these. We have, you and I, we have the ability, we have eyes, we have ears, we have a nose, we have the ability to smell. Have you, we, we never really think about that because it comes so natural. But we have the ability to smell aromas. And some things we really like and other things we don't really care for. Um, we have the ability to hear. We have the ability to put together sounds. And the thing is, is that that's just what they are. They're sounds, but we have the ability with those sounds to then also comprehend what those sounds may mean. So when somebody is speaking, it's actually sound that's coming forth, but we have the ability to then translate that with the organ that we have called the brain. We have the ability to now take that information and actually process it and, and think about it and think, okay, what was that sound that I just heard? Whether it was the sound of an animal or whether it was the sound of somebody speaking English or maybe even speaking another language, but we're hearing sound and then that sound is going not only into our ear, but then we're, we're processing it in the brain. And the thing is, is that a lot of that is just happening automatically so we don't think about it right like right now at the sound of my voice you you're not you're not thinking about okay hold on I, I just heard sounds let me process that and then like five minutes five minutes later you got what I said it's just automatic we hear the sound and it just goes through it processes and then we know what that that person is talking about or we know the sound of a of a lion roaring if we hear if we hear a lion we know we know the sound of of somebody, uh, somebody speaking, whether it's, again, English or whether it's another language. <clears throat> the brain also controls many other functions like the heart rate, heart rate, blood pressure, and breathing. We don't think about that. Like, I, I, don't, I don't ever check to make sure I'm breathing. It just, you know, I breathe. I don't, I don't check necessarily for my heart rate. Maybe if I'm exercising, kind of see where my heart rate's at and, and that type of thing. But I don't, like, every five minutes, well, you know, I got a heart rate. Is it there? Oh my God. You know, we don't, we don't do that. It's, it's an automatic function that our, actually that our brain controls. It's an automatic function that's just happening. It's just happening. It's just going on in our body. But it's something, when you think about it, how amazing is that? Like, can you imagine like every single morning if you had to turn on your body? Like, hold on, I got to turn, turn on my arm. All right, she's working now. I got to turn on my other arm, you know. I mean, first off, how do you even, how do, you even do that? Like... You know, you're still, and if you got to turn everything on, you know, you get up there and you're, and you're starting to turn, turn, on your, turn on your brain. Okay, well, I got to make sure that when I hear, when I'm hearing sounds, I got to make sure my brain's ready. All right, let me flip the switch on for my brain. Flip the switch on for my, for my heart. Wait, wait, I don't have a heart rate. Is my heart going? Wait, flip the switch on. I mean, can you imagine if we were, if we were responsible for that? But the reality is that every single one of us, we're not, we're not responsible for that. God designed the body in such a way that it works so beautifully. 
It works so amazingly. Notice this, the replication of an entire human body is stored in the double helix DNA. You want to replicate a human being? It's stored in every single one of us in our DNA. Consider the single fertilized cell of a newly conceived human life. I mean, that's another thing. There's, we have reproductive, reproductive organs that we're able to produce others of our kind. Just like we saw little Charlotte up here. You know, we have that, that ability within the human body to, to do that. Notice this. It says, from that one cell, from the single fertilized cell, from that one cell, all the different kinds of tissues, organs, and systems are developed from the one cell. The one cell. All the tissues, all the organs, all the systems that make up a human body are developed. Our body also has the immune system, which, we, which we're very familiar with, which fights off things and also repairs things that are hurt. We have this immune system that's able to heal our body. It's been built to heal the body. Can you imagine if we, if we had to be careful every single day to make sure that we don't hurt ourselves. Now, we're already careful because we don't want to hurt. We don't want to fall off of something, break a leg or break an arm or anything along those lines. We don't want ourselves to get cut and that, and that type of thing. So in, to some degree, we're already careful in, 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 in that uh, regard. But can you imagine how much more careful we would be if we knew that if I broke my arm, it can mean life or death? Like if I, if I cut myself, it can mean life or death because there was no way for the body to, to heal itself. There was no way for the body. And I'm talking about, obviously, we have doctors, they could bandage it and, and all of those things. But I'm talking about like if you were somewhere and, and you didn't have that. You didn't have, you were out in the woods hunting and you fell out of the tree or something. And you didn't have that. And you didn't have your body that was able to heal, that was able to, that, you, that your bones, you know, when, when you break a bone, and I'm not a, a professional at this, but when you, when you break a bone, and doctors place that bone back together, the bones, bones grow. They, they attach back together and, and they, they heal up. You and I don't control that. But the body that God, the body that God has made, it has that, that ability. It has the ability to heal. It has that ability to repair. It has that ability to restore. It has the ability to do things automatically that you and I, again, we don't even have to think of. We haven't even mentioned the digestive tract or the longevity of the heart. I mean, you ever thought about, what if this thing quits? Like, I mean, am I going to be okay tomorrow? And yeah, heart attacks happen and those things, those things happen. But the fact of the matter is, is that we don't have to go into, if you will, into our body and, oh, wait, I got to put a new battery in. Got to make sure, you know, the battery doesn't die out. I got to put a new battery. We don't have to be concerned about that. Because the heart is built for longevity. Um, also the formation of the nerves and the blood vessels and the cleansing, uh, the cleansing of our blood. Without question, without question, I believe personally that we are fearfully, that we are wonderfully, that we are miraculously and awesomely made by the Creator, by God Himself. And David realized this. And David said, there's something unique about this. David said, there's something special about this. There's something that, there's something that rises up with inside of me and, and, and causes me to give glory and to give praise and to give worship and to give thanks to the one that created me because the reality is I would not be here if God did not form me in my mother's womb. You would not be here if God did not plan for you. In fact, the Bible says before the foundations of the world, before God even created the world, before he created the sky and before he created the grass and the trees and the animals and the fish, you and I were already on his mind. Now that's an amazing thought. You and I were already on his mind. He was already thinking about us. He was already planning us. He was already thinking about not just our body and forming our body, not just, not just causing everything to, to work together, but he was also thinking about the gifts that he would place in your life like we talked about a few weeks back. He was, ta he was already thinking about what am I going to purpose for this one? What am I going to give this one uh, to do? What's, what's going to be the reason for this, this one to exist? See, every single one of you, none of you are here by accident. I don't care if you were born out of wedlock. I don't care if your parents didn't plan to have you. I don't care if they thought you were an accident. I don't care if it was told over you that you were an accident. Not one of you is an accident. 
and especially not one of you is an, is an accident in the eyes of God. He created you. He placed you in your mother's womb. Now, along those lines, uh, and I'm sure maybe some of you might be thinking about this, and I don't have too much time to, to spend on this, but I'm going to touch on it for just a moment. But along those lines, I know we could think about, well, what about those that are born with deformities? What about those that are born with, with diseases? Maybe a skin disease or uh, some type of sickness or some type of ailment. And here's the thing that we have to understand, is that the world at one point was perfect. It was absolutely perfect. No sin, no sickness, no disease when God created it. But the world we live in today, after Adam and Eve sinned, after they disobeyed God, after they walked away from God's perfect plan and chose an imperfect plan for their life, sin entered into the world. And no longer was the world perfect. The world was now imperfect. So even as God forms us in our mother's womb, even as God brings that uniqueness into our lives, we're still, we're still impacted by this imperfect world that we live in. And so that's, it's, and, and it's not even so much, we can't even so much blame it on like an individual person's sin, although that could be. I mean, we've all heard of crack babies, right? And, you know, some parents, moms that have chosen that route, they give birth to a, a baby that just has, it has issues, that, that little one has problems. But the fact of the matter is, is that, yes, there are deformities. Yes, there are, there are ailments. Yes, there are sicknesses and there are diseases like skin diseases and different things like that. And the reason why those things are around is simply because of the imperfect world that we live in. God never intended, it for, never intended for the world to be like that. God created it to be perfect from the jump. But we as mankind, we walked away from that. And, uh, and so that's why we have like some of those things where we, we may see. I don't know if you've ever seen the, the show. I forget if it's on Discovery or if it's on uh, 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 the other one. But uh, the, they've got a show, and, and I forget the name of it, but uh, the girl with uh, two heads. And actually, one controls the left side, and the other one c controls the right side. And they just have this show about this, this girl, and, um, or these girls, you know. And, and you just watch that, and you're just like, wow, man, that's just, that's, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's crazy, you know. But I know it also raises up questions like, well, why, did, why were they born that way? You know, why was this one born that way? You know, why did this person, why was this person birthed with a skin disease? Why was this person birthed with some type of an, an infirmity? Well, again, it goes back to the fact that we live in an, in an imperfect world, and those things affect us. Just like, and, and let me, let me uh, point this out, just like our United States government, our government makes decisions that affect you and I, right? I mean, when our government makes a decision, if they, if they raise the taxes in Florida from 6% to 10%, does that affect us? Yeah, it affects you and me, and we don't, have, we don't have necessarily a say in it. It affects us. Well, it's the same thing that sin, even though, even as Christians, even though we're walking with the Lord because we live in this imperfect world, sin still infects and, and sin still poisons, whether it's our life at different times or whether it's uh, obviously the lives of, of those around us, simply because, again, sin is around us. It's all around us. And that's the, that's the, um, that should encourage us from the standpoint of even driving us more toward the Lord to have his plan and his vision and, and, and his reason for our life as far as living our lives. We should be driven by, by what God desires. Why? Because he's got a perfect plan for us. And along those lines of a, of a perfect plan, you weren't just thrown together. So why is it, why is it that sometimes we struggle with comparing ourselves with other people? Why is it that sometimes we struggle with, with wanting to be somebody else? Why is it that we, that we, we look at ourselves and, and, and we can't be happy with who we are and what we are. Why do we, why do we have this burning sensation, if you will, to compare ourselves with somebody else or, or to try to be somebody else? Because God made you. God made you, you, and you're unique. And now obviously God being the creator, it didn't take him a whole bunch of days and a whole bunch of hours and a whole bunch of years. I mean, you're talking about perfection. And you're talking about the perfect God that's just able to think something and it happens and it goes into play. But the thing is, is it's not just that God just said, oh, let me just, 
well, this, this husband and wife, they want to have a kid. Let me just throw this child in this woman's belly and, you know, it'll, it'll form and something will happen. I'll think, of, I'll think of its purpose later. No, like I said, before the, foundation of, the foundations of the world, God was already thinking about every single human being that would walk the face of this earth. And God already had a vision for every single one of our lives. Now that's another amazing thought. Because I think sometimes we wrestle with the fact of vision. I think sometimes we wrestle with the fact of whether we even have vision for our life or not. Like some people are just going through life. Some people just wake up in the morning, they're just going through the motions, just going through the motions. I get up, I take my shower, brush my teeth, I go to work and have lunch and finish up work and drive home and come home, eat dinner, maybe take a shower, get to bed and wake up the next morning and do it all again. And, and, and to them, it's just, just going through the motions. Let me ask you something. Do you have vision for your life? Because before the foundations of the world, when God was already thinking about you, He already had vision for your life. He already had a purpose for you to fulfill. See, you have a reason for living. You have a purpose for being on this earth. There is a reason why you're here. And ultimately, yes, ultimately, it's for us to be able to find Christ, to find our Savior, find our Lord, but then also bring others into his kingdom and, and, and to come to know Christ, to give their lives to Christ, just like you and I. Because again, we're talking about this imperfect world, and God's made a way where when we die, we could spend eternity with him rather than eternity separated from him. That when we die, it's not over. That when we finally come under the subjection of the sin of this world, because God never intended for people to die, right? But because of sin, we die. In fact, God told Adam and Eve, he said, if you, if you eat of the tree that I'm telling you not to eat of, he says, you will surely die. And actually, that word translates, when you look it up in its original language in the Hebrew, it actually means that in dying, you will die. And what God was talking about is that you will die first spiritually. The connection that you and I have, that will be severed. And then you will eventually die physically. God never intended for any single one of us to die, but at some point we come under sin's, under sin's demand, if you will, because of the imperfect world that we live in. And every single one of us are growing older, whether you like it or not, ladies. We're growing older. Guys, we're getting older. And eventually we are going to die. Eventually we are going to give up the ghost. We're going to give up our, our last breath. But see, Jesus made a way made it possible where life isn't over after we die. And not only is life not over, but we're going to live forever. The question is, where? We're going to live either with God or we're going to live away from God. We're going to spend eternity with the Lord or spend eternity separated from God. One is life. The other is eternal death. Forever life, forever death. But the fact of the matter is, while that is every single, that makes up every single uh, vision for every single one of us as far as to find who our maker is and then to bring others along the way. But, the, but aside from that, you and I, each one of us, have an individual call on our life. Each one of us have an individual purpose and a vision that God thought up way before he created the world. Let me ask you something. Do you have vision for your life or are you just going through the motions? Are you wrestling with just constantly comparing yourself with other people? See, because when God, when God puts you together, God puts you together with love and God also paid attention to the details. And you know when God puts you together, after he was all done, he was totally impressed and totally pleased with what he put together in you. He was totally thrilled. He was totally in love with what he formed in that womb, in that workshop. He was totally impressed by it. He was totally in love with it. Let me ask you something. Are you in love with you? Now, I know that can, go, that can get twisted also. I'm not talking about the twisted version as far as loving ourselves. But are, are you in love with yourself? See, because you're not in love with yourself if you're constantly comparing yourself to others. You're not in love with yourself if you're constantly trying to excel and be better than everybody else around you. Who are you? Who's the person that God's made 
And are you in love with that person? Because God is. God is totally thrilled by the people that are walking the face of this earth, whether they know him personally or not. God is totally thrilled with every single person that he formed in their mother's womb. He's per perfectly pleased with the person that's there, that stands before him. How about you? Are you pleased? See, because I believe that one of the ways that we can combat this idea of constantly comparing ourselves with other people, well, you know, they got this body and I want that body. The fact of the matter is, again, you're unique. You're unique. And some people are big boned and some are not. And some people are tall and some are short. And there are all different, there are all a, a bunch of diversities. And while, while as far as the human body goes, while that's pretty much the same as far as it, uh, the way that it operates and the way that it's de designed, I mean, how do, you improve upon imp um, uh, how do you improve upon perfection? God made the body perfect. But then everything beyond that as far as looks and height and built and all of those things, yeah, there's uh, uh, some of that we can change as far as like dieting, exercising, and, and that sort of thing. And, and, and if that's something that you know that, hey, I want to, if you know, hey, I want to lose a, a, a few pounds, then do it. You can exercise. But there are things that you're not going to be able to change about yourself simply because you are uniquely you. And God made you. And God's in love with you right where you're at, with who you are, with what he made. And so there again, I believe that the way that we can combat this idea again of, of comparing ourselves with other people or the way that we can combat this idea of trying to, trying to surpass everybody else around us is to simply fall in love with who God's made. I mean, just be happy about that. Because the reality is this, guys, we're either going to be happy with the body that God's given us, the looks that God's given us, the height that, that God's given us, or it's going to bother us for the rest of, our, rest of our life, and we're going to constantly, and you think, that, you think that you're just going to do one bout of liposuction? You think that you're just going to do one bout of, of and the, it's uh, Botox, thank you. If you think that you're just going to do one bout of that stuff? You're not, when you get that, you're not satisfied. And you're going to see some other imperfection. You're going to say, oh, I need more Botox. I mean, I need more liposuction. I need to, I need to, I need to improve upon it. And sadly, sadly to say this, and I'm not trying to make fun of him, but look at Michael Jackson. I mean, it's a perfect example of a person that was constantly not happy about the way that he looked and kept going further and further and further. All I'm saying is this. If you're not satisfied now with who you are and what you are, you're never going to be satisfied. You're going to constantly want to change something. You're going to constantly want to improve on something. The way to combat that is fall in love with who you are. You know, who cares what other people think? I mean, I know it hurts. I know words hurt, and, and I know people talking behind our back and, and a, a friend telling us about it and that sort of thing. I know it hurts. I'm not, I'm not negating that. I mean, we, we all have feelings, and we all have emotions and all of those things, but the reality is this, is let people talk and let people say what they want to say. Number one, they don't have to be my friend. I don't have to hang out with them. I don't have to listen to their comments. And number two, I don't have to let it affect my life the way that it can affect my life if I allow it to. Because the fact of the matter is, who cares what everybody else says? They're a human being just like me, and they've got imperfections just like I do. And if I wanted to get into the flesh just like they do, I could talk about their imperfections just like they're talking about my imperfections. But the reality is this, is that it doesn't matter what other people are saying. What matters is, what's God say about you? What does Jesus say about you? He created you. That friend or that coworker or that family member, they didn't create you. And, and in fact, if they were the ones that created you and, and you have these imperfections, well, they failed. They messed up in some way. But the reality is they didn't create you. God did. Jesus did. And he's in love with what he created. Can you be in love with yourself? Can you be in love with the body that he's given you? Can you fall in love with who you are and fulfill the vision that he has for your life? Because the reality is this. We can go through the motions. We can go through life and, and be unsatisfied all we want. And we can miss the vision and the purpose that God has for our life. Let's go ahead and close up with this psalm.
Again, 139, look at verse 16. It says, your eyes, talking about God, your eyes saw me when I was only a fetus. Every day of my life was recorded in your book before one of them had taken place. When Blue Sky and, and when uh, Pixar, when they make uh, an animated film, they create the world, right? We were watching the video there. They create the world. They create every single one of those characters. And every single one of those characters, like Scrat, every single one of the characters, they are built and they are made to do and to act and to say exactly what the director intended for that, that character to do, say, and act. They, they, they've, got to, they've got to do it to a T. They have no thought process. They have no, no way of reasoning. They were created by the director, by the creator, by the team, and they were, they were built around this world, and they had to act the way that the director, the way that the, the producers, the way that the, uh, the developers want that character to act. And the reason why I point that out is simply because God has created this world called the earth that you and I live in. And God has created many characters. Some are more characters than others. God has created many characters, you and I, every single one of us. But here's the difference between an animated film that Pixar makes and what God did. The difference is this, is that while the character on a Pixar film has to do exactly what the director wants, you and I could do whatever we want. See, we could either choose the story that God's written about us, or we could choose our own story. We have the ability, we have the free will to choose that God's given us. We have the ability to choose whether we're going to go with the story that God's given you, given us, or we're going to live out our own story. And here's, here's what I could tell you. And just like, the, just like the verse was saying here, it says, every day of my life was recorded in your book before one of them had taken place. Before any of the days of my life came to place, God already had all of my all of my days written out. See, God has written a great story about you. It's a great story. And it leads to the very best life that you could ever live, that I could ever live. But every single one of us, we have a choice to make. Either we're going to go with God's story for our life, or we're going to go with our own story. See, God's got a great story for you. Are you willing to give him a shot? Are you willing to give him a chance and allow everything that he's written, that story that he penned down, which is the name of your book, your name is the name of the book, and he penned down your whole life, he penned down your whole story, all the good times, all the tough times, the challenges, the blessings, the successes, the failures, he wrote all of those things down, penned them down. He wrote all of your all of your victories. He wrote all of those things down, penned them all down, and it makes, it makes for a great story that will lead to the very best life that you could ever live. And I challenge you, and I encourage you this morning to fall in love with yourself and to fall in love with the story that God has written for you because it's a great story that will lead to the very best life for you, for me, and everybody else on the face of this earth. And so the question I want to close with is, Whose story am I, am I presently living in? Whose story? You make that personal. Whose story are we living in right now? Whose story are we presently living in? Whose story are we presently walking in? See, even if we're going through, even if we're going through the motions, we're still living out a story. If we're, if we're going through the motions, we just wake up and, you know, do the same old, same old. We're still living, living a story. And we're living out our story. But God's got a great story that he's written for you and I. So let's close up in a, in a, in a word of prayer. Just close your eyes for me for just a moment. And just think about that, that question. Whose story right now am I presently living in? And just be honest about that. Just be honest about what that is for you. I mean, be honest about that. If, if you're presently living in, in your own story... And you know that it's something you, you want to change. You know that it's something that you, you, want to, you want to do something different. Then right now, today, is your opportunity. It's not over. Your life is not over. Today's a brand new opportunity. It's a brand new start that you can make and say, you know, God, I've been living my story up to this point, but I'm ready. 
I'm ready to give my life to you. I'm ready to turn my life over to you. I'm ready to live the story, the great story that you've written for me. And so God, I just thank you right now in the name of Jesus for this message that you have shared with us this morning, God, and and the things that, that we've heard, Lord. And I pray, God, that as we, in everything that we've heard this morning, I pray that there would be a couple things that would just ring clearly and ring closely in our hearts. And that that would just simply be that you're in love with the person that you created in us. And that you have a great story for us. And so if you're seated here this morning and you just know you've been living out your own story and you're ready to give your life to God, you're ready to, you're ready to walk his story out, the great story that he has for you, just make it real between you and God right where you're at. Just, just tell the Lord right where you're at. Just say, God, I've been, I've been living my story. I've been walking out my story. God, I'm ready. I'm ready to live out your story for my life. I'm ready to live out the great story that you have for me. I'm ready, God, to to see every single day that you've written in your book, and I'm ready to to walk that out in my life. And God, I just pray that you would just bless every single person that makes that choice this morning to choose your story over their own or or even above a family member's story, a, a parent that that had a a plan for their child's life and wanted them to live out a certain life, God, that that we would forget all of that and that we would just embrace the story that you have for us.